Uh, last week we began our, our new sermon series in the book of Philippians titled A Gospel-Centered Joy. And if you weren't here for last week, you can check out our sermons on our website. But we talked about primarily the difference between joy and happiness. Uh, we learned that happiness is a human-centric emotion that relies on temporary earthly circumstances. The illustration was that if I gave a Mandy $1,000 and then I hit him with a cat, I don't know where that came from. I got a lot of feedback on that. Why would you throw a cat? I love cats. I ha Sorry, it was just, I, I have nothing against cats. But if, if I gave him money and then I threw a cat at him and, th and took away the money that I gave him and then robbed him on top of that, he would go from being happy to angry and sad and feeling devastated. But joy is a quiet confidence and assurance that no matter what might come, no matter what might come, we have hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Happiness can be a part of joy. You can be joyful in Jesus Christ and feel happy about it, but joy is not necessarily a part of happiness because the foundation of the two things are ultimately different, Christ or ourselves. And the second thing we talked about was how we are all united in Christ because of faithfulness and especially joy. We can persevere not only individually, but together as a church. And today we'll be moving to the second section of chapter 1 where Paul speaks about how joy helps us keep perspective in faith, not only when it's good, but especially when it's hard, when we suffer, when we're unhappy, when we're experiencing difficulty and failure. And so if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18a. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18a. If you don't have your Bibles, the words will be on the screen for your encouragement. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we continue to surrender before you, to humble our, ourselves, to not only be able to see uh, the perspective of your majesty reigning and ruling over us, but also humbling ourselves in the midst of one another, that we would not only receive your blessing in the cross of Christ, but that we would be able to actively um, speak and, and move in a way that extends and reflects your love. Holy God, at this time we are gathered and we turn our attention to your word. Um, would you be revealed in only the way that you can do things in the spirit? Would you help us, Father, to not only hear words physically, but to listen with the intent and nature of our souls and our minds? Would you help your servant? Would you help your church um, to really be humbled in your presence in a manner that is not only um, convicting, but in a manner that helps extend uh, your glory in the rest of our lives that you have given us. Take center stage at this time, Father, and be revealed. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Can anybody, uh, can anybody tell me what pi r squared finds? Say that again. See, you guys don't know either. What does pi r, we have engineers and professionals in this room. Why are we all, what does pi r square find? Area of a circle. Now here's a second question. Have you ever in your life stopped at a moment and said the answer to this situation is pi r squared? Exactly. Okay, for, for those of you who are nodding, you live very different lives. But for the vast majority of us, we've never, I've never stopped in my life and encountered hardship or difficulty and, and really thought to myself, pi r squared. And the only reason after 20 some odd years of being whatever grade I was in 
is that my tutor so militantly drove into me to remember ge geometry formulas that that's the only one I could remember. Plus a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I still don't know what it's supposed to find, but it's just easier to remember. Those two formulas, I've mentioned before that I am not a math and science person. They're gonna revoke my Korean card. But there was something so inherently difficult about geometry for me. And it got to the point where every night I would go home and lay out my geometry homework, and I would most nights be moved to almost tears. I didn't understand. I didn't get it. And I know that in the light of being 38 years old, it, it's not a big deal, but at that moment in my life, it was suffering, it was imprisonment, it was being chained to something that I not only didn't understand, but I didn't know why they were making me do this when I wasn't planning on becoming a mathematician. My homework pages were stained literally by my tears. And I was that child thinking, why does my mom hate me? And why do I have to do this? I didn't get it. Now, I'd love to tell you that afterwards, like if you made your children do violin or play sports and they hated it, but you didn't let them quit and help them persevere, they learned life lessons. But the problem is, I didn't learn life lessons from geometry. None of us did. If you enjoy math, God bless you. But in the larger scope of life, I didn't get it. And I don't know how many hours of frustration and tear-stained homework assignments I did. And even when I cheated somehow and looked in the back of the book and wrote down the answers, I still couldn't get any higher than a C. Why? Because you have to show your work. To this day, to this day, God bless us. If we ever have kids, homework is going to be my wife's area of parenting especially if it's math, because I'm going to whisper to them, none of this matters. <laughs> Google will tell you. There are apps today, did you know, that you can download that you just put in the question, mathematic question, and it'll tell you the answer. And if you pay, I actually found this out this week. If you don't go for the free trial version, but you pay, it'll show you the work of how to get there. How are we not all getting 4.0s? I don't understand. College students don't cheat, but it's there for you to just study. Here's why we're talking about geometry. You can say that I lived a pretty privileged life, but it was one of the, honestly, it was one of the most burdensome, hard things that I've done in my life. And I still barely passed. When it comes to personal hardship and suffering, there's this interesting social notion of, of our society and our culture today where we see our failures and struggles as the primary point. We as a community, we as a culture now, when we start on a project or an endeavor, we don't keep our perspective fixed on the purpose or where we are going. Our primary focus is on step four, and this is really hard, or I don't want to do it. And especially if you're mid-30s and younger, we are known as a generation that is great at starting something, but we rarely ever finish. Why? Because we are too easily distracted. We are too easily stumbled. We are too easily discouraged. We are prone to losing our purpose and heart in the brittle nature of our convictions because we believe explicitly or implicitly that, we, that our experience, our feelings, are the most important Thing. Now, I could extrapolate on this and talk to you about how people choose churches, how people like or dislike pastors, and from a church context, you would be shocked to learn that it has to do with how you feel when you walk into a church building or when you hear someone preach, rather than really wondering, is the gospel being preached, and not what can I get out of this church, but how can I plug in and pour into this church as the gospel calls us to. But that's another sermon for another time. When it comes to our faith, this issue comes to the forefront because the problem with this is, again, we are focused all too entirely on our feelings, our experience, our hardship, our struggle. And faithfulness, trust, obedience, perseverance, boldness in the gospel is the, ultimately the first thing to go out the window. What does Christ call us to? In verse 12 through 14, Paul's theme is the advance of the gospel. He says in verse 12, I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. 
This is a powerful statement that Paul is making. He's writing to them from prison. And notice that he doesn't even say to them in a whining way, oh my goodness, can you believe what God is making me do? Why do I have to be in prison? I'm only trying to serve him. But what he's, he's focusing on the fact that even in his suffering, what has happened to him is actually serving, moving to advance or promote or grow the kingdom of God in the gospel. And notice also that he doesn't say his imprisonment, but the things that have happened to him. He leaves it open-ended. Why does he leave it open-ended? He's talking not just about his present circumstances, but to the beloved church in Philippi, he's reminding them of all that he has gone through in his personal history as a Christian for the sake of the gospel. He has endured riots and rebellions. He was previously imprisoned in Jerusalem, Rome, and Caesarea. He had to appeal to Caesar for his life more than one time so that they wouldn't kill him simply for speaking the gospel publicly. He has been his life has been threatened. He has been on trial. He's had to escape in the dark of night and climb over a wall. He is hated by fellow Christians. And every moment is a moment of uncertainty. Now just consider this for a second. If I was starting a small business and I went through all this and the entirety of my preparation for it, would you say to me, Paul, sounds like you're doing great. Keep going. No. You would say your idea for individualized corn dogs is not a great idea. And you're failing at every step of the way. Stop. This is not going well. That anyone outside the church would have deemed him a failure already. They would have said, stop. You are not doing well. Why doesn't Paul give up? Why does he persevere in the face of such obvious opposition, obvious failing, and obvious brokenness? He writes in verse 13. It has really served to advance the gospel so that it might become known throughout the whole imperial guard, meaning the prison, entire prison, and that my, that my imprisonment is for Christ. He says that even if I'm in prison, whether I'm on an island on vacation, whether I'm traveling to Ephesus, whether I'm on a boat that's going to be shipwrecked, whether I'm standing in court and these four men can decide the future of my life, he says, wherever I am and wherever I'm going through, the purpose of my life will be to speak and advance the gospel for the glory of God. This conviction has actually already happened in Acts 16. Paul and Silas are walking along and this demon-possessed girl who was a fortune teller, whose owners, who she was a slave and whose owners made tons and tons of money off of her, stopped her fortune telling after she saw Paul and Silas and she walked after them, screaming at the top of her lungs, even though she didn't know who they were and what they were about. These two are children of God. They are messengers of God. They serve the Most High. They are messengers of the Messiah. And she raised such a ruckus that the Roman leadership and the government arrested Paul and Silas for proclaiming the gospel publicly. And because this demon-possessed girl, even her, even the demon acknowledged the presence of God's servants there. And so they arrested them, they beat them, and they threw them in prison. And Acts 16 tells us that all they did in prison, even through the night, was they spoke to each other in scripture and they sang praises to God to the point where everyone in prison could hear what they were saying and hear the songs they were singing. Now again, I didn't sing songs when I was studying geometry. That was when I would turn up hardcore rock or rap and just let the anger rule me. But they were even in their imprisonment, in their chains, bearing the scars of beating, they were persisting in hope and joy and singing songs of praise to God. And all of a sudden at midnight, there's an earthquake. The entire prison shatters to the ground. The, do the doors to all the cells open and everyone can go free. And the one guard on night watch, the one man whose responsibility was to keep the prisoners in, sees this happening and he takes out his sword and is about to kill himself because that was the honorable thing to do. All the prisoners had escaped. And as Paul and Silas see this prison guard about to kill himself, they cry out, stop, we are still here. None of us ran away. Don't harm your own body. And at the show of compassion, after hours of hearing Paul and Silas singing praises to God, talking to each other in scripture, this prison guard falls on his knees in surrender before Paul and Silas, and he asks them, what must I do to be saved? 
This is the moving of the Holy Spirit, not by the perfection of Paul and Silas, but by the joyful perseverance of God's servants. And they say to him, believe in Jesus Christ as your savior and you and your family will be saved. And so the prison guard takes Paul and Silas to his home. They clean their wounds. They present them with food. They fellowship together and they baptize the prison guard and his family and the church of Jesus Christ grows. And it wasn't by slick marketing. It wasn't by having programs at church. It wasn't by charismatic preaching. It was simply by the saints of the kingdom of heaven, joyfully in every circumstance, holding to the gospel and persevering. That the gospel is greater and that we are second. Look even at the nature of Paul's purpose and power in his life. That God is moving to accomplish his will even through this broken human being. Do you remember who Paul is? That's not his actual name. His name was Saul. Now, this was a rude awakening to me because I was supposedly named after this great missionary. And then I heard about Paul was the biggest Christian hunter in the early church times. He was feared more than the emperor of Rome among Christians. They would sit in their homes. They would sit in their church meetings fearing Paul more than Caesar in Rome. Why? Because he was known to be relentless and filled with hatred, and he executed Christians simply for their faith. He made it his life's work and calling to hunt down Christians. In fact, Saul was there for the first martyr or the killing of the first Christian, Stephen. Paul was part of the crowd that encouraged them to do it. And yet on the road to Damascus, as he's going to hunt more Christians, Jesus meets Paul and blinds his eyes with, a, with light. And the irony is that in the physical blindness of Saul, before the light of Christ, he sees who Jesus is as Lord and Savior. And Jesus says what? You are now mine. Stop persecuting my body. Your name is now Paul. Now go. And joyfully and faithfully live for me. This is not only the perspective of Paul clinging to joy and confidence in Christ while he is chained in prison. This is the history of the experience and faithfulness of God showing up time and time again. Our issue is, is that unlike Paul, when we experience hardship, our focus, our desires, our purpose, our passion, immediately shift to our suffering and situation and circumstance, and we forget about the faithfulness of God that has carried us thus far. We do. Because we are entranced, and we love, and we worship the idol of happiness. And the more devastating point of happiness is, when I say that, we worship ourselves more than we honor and worship God. This is why the church struggles with joy. This is why the church compartmentalizes, here's my church life or identity, here's my work life and identity, here's my social life and identity, here's my family life, and all the different IDs and login whatever we have, login personas that we have, and yet Christ says, I'm not lowered over your church life, but I'm Lord over every living, breathing, existing thing in creation. And no matter what you go through, I am still greater. And you are second to me. Beloved, it is not about our circumstances or Paul's circumstances, but it's about the purpose and will of God for us. It is not how about, about how we feel, but the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, not only saving us, but through us to be given to the world. At the basic core of the gospel, this is the essence of it. And you know what the dirty admission of the church is that we have a hard time professing or confessing? you and I think that we sit at the center of the gospel. What do we hear from Sunday school? Jesus loves you so much that he went and died to the cross. You are so loved. You are a child of God. And that's not necessarily wrong, but that message doesn't change very often from kindergarten through adulthood. It doesn't. Listen to preaching in the church today. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm like vanguard of the new wave or whatever, but if you listen to actual Christian preaching, we are at the heart of the gospel. Jesus saved you. 
Jesus saved me. And that's the end of the story. And we so easily forget that Christ not only died for us, but Christ died for his own sake, his own glory first. And this is what Paul understands, maybe in knowledge, but the difference between, between Paul and a faithful Christian is that he not only knows, but he actually submits and he obeys the gospel. That Christ would be first that Christ would be obeyed, and that the gospel would be more important in advancing and being known through our lives rather than our own well-being and comfort. What's interesting to me is that Paul's sitting in prison. In verse 14, he says, my imprisonment for the gospel has not actually discouraged the church, but it has encouraged the church. It's encouraged the church to see a leader or a servant of the church being willing to even go to prison and not quitting and proclaiming proclaiming the gospel wherever he goes. And so they themselves stood up and began to preach boldly, to love actively, and to pour out of themselves for others obediently to Christ. Then he closes in 15 through 18. In the final section of the text today, Paul addresses others who are speaking of the gospel. You know, if we... If we had the time, if I, had, if I asked you to describe Paul as a person, how would you describe him according to his letters and how we speak about him in church? Charismatic. He was a lawyer. Committed. Dedicated. One of the most entertaining parts of seminary was when I actually researched the personhood of Paul through historical writers. And Paul was actually short, skinny. And one historian called him incredibly difficult to look at because he was so ugly. Apparently, Paul, someone said, well, you thought Paul was hot? I don't know where you got that. Jesus is also white. No, he's not. Paul's nose was so big and crooked that people had a hard time looking at him physically. Now, you have to be a special kind of ugly to, to be difficult to look at. And this was a man who had to go in public, looked at, and to speak eloquently to strangers that had no idea or didn't willingly come to listen to him because he was publicly preaching to crowds. On top of that, what's striking about the Apostle Paul was that even though he was knowledgeable, even though he was a Pharisee, even though he was a lawyer, he was not actually eloquent himself. He wasn't good at preaching or teaching publicly. In fact, he was that preacher, when you read on the schedule that he's up next week, people would not come to church that week because they would be busy. See, the fact that you didn't really respond means that you feel that way also. You need to think about that. But the astounding nature of that is that even though Paul is so incapable, unworthy, and on top of that, beyond his personal life and personal physical looks, the fact that he was so powerfully used by God tells us that it's not about the person, it's about the God. It's not about you and me, it's about what we are willing to do to surrender and obey God. And Paul sitting in prison is saying that there, I have enemies. I'm ugly. I'm not eloquent. People think they can be a better church planter, missionary, pastor, preacher than I am. And they might be right. But whether the people, boldened by my imprisonment, whether they're preaching the gospel to encourage me or to be supportive of me, or whether to take my church members away, or whatever it might be, because they're my opposition or my enemies, As long as the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached, it doesn't matter. Now, I don't know of one pastor that feels that way, including myself. If the church across the street, I don't know what they're called, their pastor becomes famous, writes books, goes on YouTube, and you you watch his clips of just like dynamic four seconds of his sermon, and it's just amazing, and you all leave, I can't in my heart tell you that my attitude would be as long as the gospel is being preached go. No. What would we do as a church? I don't know, start serving lunch, start dressing better, give you money for coming. I don't, I don't know. What churches do crazy things? But it's, it's incredible to me that Paul's attitude, even when it comes to the gospel, is not that Christ would be first and I would be second. It's not that I will persevere in difficulty and I will have joy and advancing the gospel be more important to me. But he says, as long as the gospel is being preached, and even I am destroyed, then I am good with that. Because the gospel is not about me. The gospel is not about you. As long as others hear the grace of God 
as long as the kingdom of God is established and grown, as long as God is glorified, that's all that I want. Beloved, I know that this is hard, but this is the heart of faithfulness. This is a correct perspective between God and his creation. Church is not about us. Yes, it's here to serve you. Yes, we are here to preach and proclaim the word of God. But the ultimate essence of church is not to bless you. It's not to make my name known. But it's to establish the kingdom of God outside of these walls. This is a temporary meeting where we are filled to go out and to build the kingdom of God. The challenge for us, though, is that church today, Christianity today for us, is not preached, is not taught, and is not lived out in such a way. Paul's point is that human control, human jealousy, and getting personal credit or recognition is not the point, but simply that we are second to Christ, and we are second to the gospel growing. Before we close, just a couple of things to think about. The first question that I want to ask us is, what is the greater thing that we give ourselves to? What is the greater thing that you give yourself to? I think Tim Keller famously said that everyone worships something. We just need to figure out if it's God or not. Giving worship or giving ourselves to something, it means that we are giving worth to something to recognize it as important, to love it, to be filled with passion for it. And you can see it in someone's life by how they live, by how they speak, and by the passions of their lives. Could they look at me and say that my worship and what I give myself to is Christ? I hope so. Can you see me as your pastor? And can you trust, not in me, but at the minimum that I am seeking the glory of God before my own kingdom, before my own brand, before my own well-being. I hope so. One of the greatest compliments in ministry that I've ever gotten was from a Starbucks barista in Stockton, California. It's about an hour and a half from here. It's the most ghetto, violent city in the world. And near our church, there was a Starbucks that I went to every single day at 9.30 on my way to church to get coffee. And we had a lot of church meetings there. I was there for three years. And this one lady was always there. I never asked her her name, but she got to know me to the point where she knew exactly what I wanted and she would have my drink waiting for me by the time that I got there. It was a pretty in intense relationship. <laughs> Three years, and finally I was about to go. Uh, we were, I, was, I was called to go plant a church in San Diego, and I said to her, for some reason, it's my last day in Stockton. And she said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, here's a tip. Thanks for being so great over the past three years. And then I, she said, thank you. And I turned around and left. And she turned around and she said, Paul. She knew my name, not because I told her, but she writes it on my cup all the time. Paul, what do you do? And I got embarrassed. I don't know, pastors, have they ever told you this, but when I get my hair cut and after establishing a relationship with someone that's cuts my hair, when they finally, after four months, ask me what I do, there's a moment of hesitation. I don't know what it is. But I've been on planes and people have been talking my ear off and telling me the most inappropriate and dirty jokes or the most intimate details that they should never tell anyone. But an hour and a half into the flight, what do you do? I'm a pastor. They, don't, they stop talking to me. And there's judgment. But this barista asked me, what do you do? And after a moment, I was like, I'm not going to ever see her again. I said, I'm a pastor. I, mean, I serve at the church right up the road. And she just looked at me. And I said, here comes the judgment. Now, now there's another person. And all she said was, I could see that. And she turned around and went to do her job. I sat in my car and I almost cried. <laughs> it was, I don't know what it was, but it was that simple, I could see that, was a testimony that I had not been trying to impress her. I had not been purposefully having church meetings at the Starbucks. But there was something about the way that I breathed in front of her or sat where the grace of God was somehow evident. This is what Paul's talking about. And I've been to that Starbucks in good times. I've been to that Starbucks in blessing and confidence. But I was also there wondering, is ministry really for me? Is God really at the center of this church? Should I quit and go find a normal job where I could get a normal life? What are we giving ourselves to? 
And the established truth of the gospel is that anything apart from Christ is nothing. Nothing. I have friends that are my age or older still living in their parents' basement playing World of Warcraft to this day. And they're still dreaming of the day that they'll be successful and rich. But what are we really giving ourselves to? At a certain point, we have to be able to look in the mirror and in humility and confession say, I have not been giving myself to Christ. I've been giving myself to everything and anything in the world other than Christ. But the grace is that God still disciplines, that God still refines, that God still calls sinners for his own name and glory because there's no other kinds of people. You know what I'm astounded by every time when I read through the Bible, Old Testament through New Testament, is that we revere these people in these words as if they were holy, but every single one of them was a murderous, sinful, unfaithful reject of society. And our hearts are so prone to worship humanity and ourselves that we say, oh, what a great man or what a great woman, and we rarely say, what a great God. The conflict is that we might say with our lips that Christ is enough and that he is greater than all our struggles, but the reality of our priorities, when we truly value and love, comes to light, not when it's good, but in our suffering. What do you turn to when you suffer? I turn to old vices, old addictions. When I'm stressed out, tobacco in any form is what I really, really can't forget about. Why? Because I grew up and I smoked for a while. I quit. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. But you know how I know that that is a burden or a temptation that I have to carry it for the rest of my life? Any time that I encounter stress or heartache or just difficulty, my first thought is, just go to the gas station and all of this could be solved. It won't be. And yet Christ is still merciful. Christ still calls us his own. And Christ still calls us to his purpose. But Pastor Paul, have you read Jeremiah 29? Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says this. Good transition. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And we see this printed on mugs. You put it on your social media. We believe in this thing. And what would we take this verse as? God loves you. He wants you to be happy. He wants you just to live that contented, Christian, American, Instagram-worthy life where everything is great and you're all celebrities and you're all rich and you can go on vacation and have the perfectly... But keep reading the next two verses. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I almost never see the last two verses posted. God is saying that I have a plan for you, but it's not a plan for your happiness. It's for my glory. God is saying I have a plan for you, But it's not for your well-being, or it's not for you to get what you want, but what you will find actually what you truly desire when you find and seek after me. The point is me, not you. And we have twisted this verse, which we so easily do in so many areas of our lives, where we think it's about our happiness. But beloved, beloved, it's not about our happiness. It's about our joy in Jesus Christ, and that we are second to Christ. Matt Chandler famously said correctly a couple years ago, God is for God, not for us. That bothers some of us, doesn't it? Because we think God is for us. God so loved the world. But God is primarily, first and foremost, for himself, not for our well-being or happiness. You know why I revel in that and that's good, though? Because God is perfect, just, righteous, merciful, His love is not just love, but has said he will search and chase us throughout history. He is good. He is compassionate. And he is our heavenly and perfect, loving father. And if he is for himself and we are second to him, then there is no better place in the world to be. There is no better place. And the fact that he's not only for himself, but he calls us as his own children, and he redeems and uses sinners for his own glory, means that we get to be a part of the kingdom 
and family of God. If we would submit, if we would obey, that we are second to Christ, not before him. You know, I get it. Difficulty stinks. Some of us, though, when we encounter hardship and difficulty, we think we've been buried, written off as dead. But in the gospel, in the hope of Jesus Christ, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I are never buried or planted. Buried things never come back up. But in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as he comes back to life, we go from being buried and condemned justifiably because of our sins to being planted to grow and, and to grow into the evidence of the glory of God. So, beloved, I encourage you, I implore you, in the word of God today, beyond anything else, we are second to Christ. Our imprisonment, our chains, our failures, our, our lack of success or whatever it might be, do not, defy, do not define us. And if God has kicked you into the hallway or out of the building entirely, praise him there. Worship him there. Love those that he has put in your life there, wherever it might be, so that the gospel would be known as we trust that we have not been buried but planted for the glory of God and for our good. Let's pray. Would you ask God for clarity at this time? And before I close this, I want to give you time with your Father, the one who is for his glory first, the one who loves you too much to let you have what you want in your, in your brokenness, and the one who uses even your vanity, even our brokenness, even our pride for his sake. Would you pray and, and thank God first for his love that pursues us in all things? And would you really wonder before him, are we second to Christ? Are we committed to proclaiming the glory of his gospel wherever we go, whatever we go, whatever we experience and however we feel? Let's take some time in reflection and prayer before God and I'll close in a few minutes. Let's pray. Holy God, would you remind us that when we say that you are sovereign, and even when we can't remember to say it because we're so fixated on our own experience and feelings, the fact that you are sovereign means that we are not. The fact that you are Lord and King and Savior, it means that we are not. We confess that we have lived both individually as Christians, even as a church, and trying to take your place of honor and glory. 
we have lived our lives pursuing our own well-being and we have seen our suffering, our struggles, our difficulty as signs to stop our faithfulness, to stop our obedience and surrender and just lick our wounds as if our situation is more important and greater than who you are and what you have done. Lord, would you forgive us? In our arrogance, would you help us to see it and to confess of it and to turn away in repentance? Lord, help us to trust you, that you use broken things, that you use sinners for your name because there are no other kinds of people, that we are not buried in our, in our devastation and our brokenness and our failures, but we are planted to be a continuing testimony of your power and presence and your faithfulness at work. Lord, help us to be very clear on what you call us to in the words of Paul, to be joyful, to rejoice, and to keep our perspective and the purpose of our lives really fixed and and kept in who you are and what you have done and what you will do. And that that would give us joy and that that would give us not only a reason, but the purpose of our lives. And no matter where we go, that it would be known that you are God and that you have come and sent your son to the cross. For your glory and our good, Heavenly Father, we commit these things to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.